Hey there, Team Healthy. It's Wednesday at 11 o'clock Central Time here in the U.S., and that means it's ready for us to do the Midweek with Dr. C segment, right? You all have sent quite a few uh, good questions in. In fact, I, I'm going to go with the gold star question right here up front at the very beginning. Hey, look, I noticed we have, uh, all right, there's somebody from Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know if you know, I grew up in the Atlanta, Georgia area. College Park, to be example, so I, uh, to be exact. So, Stephen, I see you uh, being there from Atlanta. I lived real close to the airport. Go down Camp Creek Parkway and, and uh, hang a couple of lefts, you get to my neighborhood. So, uh, there you go. And, and All right. We, we have our friends here from New Zealand and Australia. And I'm telling you, I, it's, it's 1 or 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning there for you guys. And so, uh, you're the night owls. I can promise you at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm um, sawing logs. But And it's okay, Staten Island. Hey, look, we, we're, we have people from everywhere. Uh, there's another from Canada. Uh, let, let us know where you're from. And we have a very broad community. And what it says is uh, we're, we're in this together and we're dispersed. You know, human nature is what it is, no matter what culture you're in. And that's why the words that we talk about relative to narcissism can resonate so broad. And just know that when I talk with you about the topic of narcissism, I really am talking about human nature. Uh, it's, it's in our natural inclination to want to be in control and to be selfish or to, uh, uh, to have uh, insensitivities at times. Healthy people see that. And they own it, they acknowledge it, and they do something about it. And they're able to keep their tendencies way down to a low percentage. Uh, if you want to put it on a mathematical scale, uh, healthy people, uh, their narcissism tends not to get too far beyond the 20% level. And we're not even going to call that narcissism, really. It's when people make it uh, an ongoing pattern to where they're more that way than they are the other. That's when you uh, begin to, uh, to look into what we refer to as narcissism. So just a little primer there. All right. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm doing is each week I'm, I'm coming up with a title that uh, at least picks up on some of the questions that we have. And today I'm talking about a narcissist consistent inconsistency. Uh, and several of you uh, wrote in some questions relative to this and other kind of topics I might add. So let's just dive right in. Uh, those of you who are brand new, if you want, you can put the questions uh, in the live chat. If you're watching live, if you're watching on tape, uh, or if you uh, want to go back and do it, you can put it on the in the comments section uh, below the video, and I will pick up on uh, your questions, and I copy and paste, and then next week I'll answer uh, more questions that come in. And by the way, next week I will be running live, even though it's in the holiday season. By the way, I hope everyone does have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holiday, wherever you are and what your traditions are. Um, okay, so let, let's go with this first question. This person asks, Dr. C, how does, the, and I'm going to go ahead and give this one the gold star for the day. How does the covert narcissist have an idealized view of themselves and at the same time, they're driven by their shame. Okay, pause right there. I mentioned to you a narcissist consistent inconsistency. This is a primo example. And uh, the person that uh, sent this in uh, articulates it so well. Uh, they have an idealized view of themselves, but at the same time, they're driven by shame. And, and it, both are true, by the way. They fish for compliments and reassurance and validation and are also boastful and know about everything, including what others are really thinking. They want pity and admiration. Do they vacillate between believing their alternate reality and doubting it? In which case they would know that they're lying sometimes and other times they believe their own changing stories. In other words, what's going on here with these gross inconsistencies here. Now, you, you've heard me mention many times that uh, narcissism is built upon childish reasoning. Uh, they're, uh, they've never grown up, okay? And they, offer, they have what I refer to as pre-adolescent thinking. 
you know, in your teenage years, you begin to develop abstract thinking that leads to your development of, uh, of well-conceived values and principles and standards. And then as you go deeper into your adult years, uh, then you're able to refine that in a great way. And sometimes uh, some of your beliefs or emphasis can shift uh, as the years and decades go by. But, uh, but healthy individuals are thinkers. Uh, they go into the why, why am I the way that I am? Uh, how might I make some improvements? Narcissists never get to that place. Uh, they're stuck in, uh, in the rules and regulations. They're stuck in uh, the notion that there are people out there who are judging them. And I, I say that as a prelude to answering this question. Um, they are shame driven. Very early on in their lives, narcissists realize that if you say or do the wrong thing, you're going to get clobbered. Now, it could be that that narcissist grew up as the golden child, and so they may have been spared inside their home uh, from some of the judgment. But even those know that judgment is out there and you have to learn how to uh, maneuver around it. Many people, they weren't necessarily the golden child. They were on the receiving end of lots of overt shame and ridicule. What's wrong with you? Uh, why can't you do uh, things better? Why aren't you like your big brother and things like that? Uh, or and it's not just inside the home. It's in our culture where we know that there's a real strong grading system. And so it sets up the possibility for uh, young budding narcissists to operate off of shame. If I let people know what's really wrong about me, I'm going to come off looking bad and people aren't going to like me. So they're in a constant compensation mode and they're constantly trying to figure out what do I have to do so that I don't have to live in the shame of people knowing my faults or my deficiencies. What I'll do is I'll pretend that I'm superior and I'll pretend that I don't need any help and that I'm beyond whatever input others want to give me. And so that's where they start that inconsistency. They know that shame is waiting for them, but they have uh, devised a strategy of trying to be superior in the control and the know-it-all, and therefore they don't need to hear from you, which becomes the lack of empathy. And when you, when you say they vacillate, that's an excellent way to put it. But then that question uh, do they uh, vacillate between believing in their alternate reality and then doubting it? Uh, and that being the case that sometimes they know they're lying and, and they change their stories. I'm going to go back and say this pattern developed pre-adolescent. And as a result, you know, pre-adolescents tend not to have really strong uh, reasoning skills. This, this question is asking, uh, do they not uh, have good reasoning? And the answer is no. Not only does the pattern of narcissism develop in those early years, but they remain stuck in a low reasoning pattern and they never grow out of it. In their uh, teen years and early adult years and then beyond, uh, they remain in that childish state. And so what appears to an insightful and healthy individual to be vacillation and lying to oneself, um, it's, it's not the same as that. Uh, you or I, as, a, uh, as an insightful person, can see through the inconsistencies. Narcissists don't because their rationale, their reasoning is still stuck. It's fascinating to take a look at that. Now, let, let's go to another question that kind of picks up on a, a similar theme. This person asked, I've been wondering, how do narcissists live with themselves with all the pain chaos and havoc they inflict upon others. Is it as, as, as you say that they have no insight into their behavior or that they just justify it? I'm having a hard time dealing with their hurtful ways. How can anyone think it's okay to live this way and not be at the far end of the spectrum? Uh, and and, and th this next question, this uh, question I'm asking, it, it illustrates the same kind of thing. You're asking, uh, do they just have no insight into their own behavior? And the answer is, that's right. In fact, I've, I've had multiple uh, videos where I've commented on uh, the fact that they have an astonishing low level of insight. You can spell it out to these individuals point blank. You can draw pictures. You can give illustrations about how uh, they're, they're showing a lack of insight and you can give the alternative and they're going to look at you and say something like, 
you don't know what you're talking about. And that's the crazy making part of dealing with narcissists. Uh, they don't have the insight. And so when you ask, how can they think it's okay to, to live this way? It, it's it's kind of like, um, well, let, let, let's use an analogy. Uh, I grew up in the United States of America, so I speak English. Uh, thanks to our UK people that brought it over, I guess, uh, centuries ago. Some of you live in countries where English is not the primary language. Uh, and, and I say, well, you know, why, why do you have a hard time speaking English? Well, when the answer is, I grew up thinking a different language. Well, just speak my language. <laughs> well, it, it's not quite that simple. Yes, we can shift languages and we can learn new languages. Uh, but typically, we tend to go with what we were brought up with. And most narcissists were brought up with this. Uh, this need to say, I, I've got, I've got to look better than I've got to cover up my flaws. They're in a highly defensive mode uh, to this uh, person's question. You know, how do they live with themselves knowing that they create pain and chaos? The answer to that question is uh, they use the defense mechanism of blame shifting. That's one of their favorite ones. Uh, whenever there is chaos or disarray and, and, uh, and pain in front of them, instead of saying, yeah, and I, I had a major uh, role in, in creating that, what they'll say is, well, good thing you have me around because look at all you idiots out there. You don't know what you're doing. You're, you're living incorrectly. I sure wish I didn't have to live with you. And so as long as they can convince themselves uh, that you're the problem, they're okay. And they've been doing that since way, way early on. I mean, when was the last time you uh, caught a, an eight-year-old kid red-handed doing something wrong and that kid said something like, well, it was Jimmy's fault or Susie did this or my teacher didn't tell me something or whatever it might be. They're still doing it at age 38 or 52 or 79. They don't grow up. And, and, and that's why there are these inconsistencies. And when you bring your more adult and refined way of thinking to the equation, you'll have to factor that in knowing that there's going to be a great disparity between who you are and, and who they are. Got my papers all mixed up here. All right, let, let's go with another question. And this one asks, are narcissists aware that they project a false persona and that they hide behind a mask? Or is it so subconscious that they don't even realize they're projecting a false persona? Uh, there has to be some level of awareness if they're outright lying. And then this next question, our next comment, but tell lies to yourself often enough and you believe them. And, and I wanted to put this one in because that, that this person gets it. If you tell yourself lies often enough, it actually starts becoming your truth. And, uh, and that's, that's where narcissists are stuck. Uh, much of this is so habituated that it, it is uh, um, of a subconscious nature. So let's keep all of that in mind. Okay. Um, this next one comes from uh, someone in uh, Samso in Denmark, the island of Samso in Denmark. So it's one of those little island chains right up there. Uh, so pleased to have you with us. Uh, this person says, uh, you've talked about the shame and guilt that narcissists have inside that they can't resolve. How, how can it be resolved if they decide or could see that it needs to be resolved? And then thanks. And uh, she identifies that she comes from, uh, from Denmark. Well, we mentioned that uh, uh, they tend to have a very low level of insight. But when you ask, how can these individuals move on and, and learn how to get beyond that hidden guilt and shame that's on the inside, First, they have to acknowledge that there's something that's dreadfully wrong in their lives. Inevitably, narcissists have a, a, a wide array of broken relationships that they've been associated with. Uh, you look at these individuals and over time, uh, it's like uh, there's just a, 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 long, a big wake of bodies out there that they just kind of kicked in the shins and destroyed. And, and uh, there's so many people that have been frustrated that narcissistic person at some point in their life, if they're going to change, need to say, wait a minute, 
the, the key ingredient in all of those um, uh, dysfunctional people that I see in my life is me. <laughs> I'm the common denominator. I've been with all of them. And at some point, they would have to acknowledge, I can't just go around blaming everyone for every problem. I have to take a look at who I am. And so if they are going to change, they would have to come to that realization. Now, I'm, I strongly suspect that many of you who are watching right now would say, well, I don't know that that's ever going to happen with the, that or those narcissists in my life. Typically, if, uh, if it is going to happen, it tends to come on the heels of some sort of personal crisis, uh, whether it's you know, they uh, have uh, can come to terms with substance abuse or alcoholism or they've had an affair or there's a huge blow up inside their family that they were involved in. Or if they have been fired from the job from the for three times in a row now, at some, at some point, some kind of crisis tends to come along. And, and that perhaps can be the catalyst for them to turn on the light switch and say, wait a minute, I need to take a hard look at me. Now, if they do get to that point, and many of them don't, but if they do, uh, let's just go with the uh, the 12-step program that uh, that uh, people in recovery start with or uh, go with. And the beginning point is they have to admit that they're powerless. They don't have the capacity to control life and make it unfold the way they want. That is step one. And if they can get to that place, then there are all sorts of other steps that are a part of the recovery process that they can engage with. But you can't get uh, you can't move uh, to some place if you don't acknowledge that you're uh, you're the problem. And so uh, how do they get beyond the, uh, the guilt and shame that's that's hidden on the inside? They have to be honest about it. And then there are uh, all sorts of therapies that people can uh, can enter into. Uh, what I do would probably fall under the category of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. You, you take a look at the thoughts that are associated with your behaviors or your attitudes that have not worked, your anger management skills, your conflict resolution skills, et cetera. And, and then you take a look at the cognitions that go along with those behaviors, the thoughts. And you learn, if, for example, if you're screaming at somebody and uh, you're managing your anger poorly, uh, uh, CBT would say, let's take a look. Why are you feeling so angry? Well, I feel disrespected. Okay. Uh, why do you feel disrespected? And uh, where did that come from? And, and how did that become such a, a huge issue to you to the point that you have to scream at the top of your lungs? And so you, you learn how to take the, uh, the behavior and break down uh, the thoughts that are associated with it. And then it's like, what would be our better alternatives? What would that look like? And how would you have to shift your thinking? It's like learning that new language all over again. So that's kind of how therapy can work. Okay. And by the way, if people have been pretty entrenched in a pattern of narcissism, they really do need therapy uh, typically, uh, or at the very least, we have our classes that we offer and things like that. That It's a highly therapeutic kind of thing uh, to walk through in a way, but they need to, uh, to, to have something that's more formalized to, to walk them through some of the change process. It can be done, um, but there needs to be uh, some guidance along the way from somebody that really knows uh, how to do that. Uh, this next one, and, and I've noticed in some of the, uh, the comments before I came on the air that some of you are already dealing with this one, trying to break away from that narcissist. This person says, please tell me, Dr. C, why does it hurt so with a lot of O's? Why does it hurt so much when I've had to ask my verbally and emotionally and, and bullying husband to leave again, my verbally and emotionally abusive and bullying husband to leave again. This is the first time I've ever not begged him to come back, but the guilt and pain is eating me up. But the walking on the eggshells was too. Um, you know, it's, it's so easy when somebody on the outside looking into your life uh, sees that you're in pain and difficulty and they just say, well, go no contact. And you know that there are times when I uh, strongly support that. There are times when that's really the only uh, resolution that you can have for uh, if you're going to expect uh, the pain to go away. But even then, it doesn't go away entirely. And then, frankly, part of the problem with breaking off from that narcissist is 
there's such a huge ripple effect, particularly if uh, this is someone that you're either married to or you're working with and you have to go away or extended family. And, and so many different things begin to change that that go no contact uh, attitude can sometimes be a little too simplistic because it doesn't take into account all the many uh, variables that are a part of it. Uh, and so you have to factor all that in. Now, when you ask, why is it so, uh, why does it hurt so much? Uh, let's keep it. And then you feel so guilty because of that. Let's keep in mind, the guilt is not on your side of the ledger. You're the receiving person. Uh, you're the recipient of the bullying and the, uh, the emotional and verbal abuse. You're not the one putting it out. And so guilt is the emotion that is associated with blameworthiness. Keep in mind, I just said a few minutes ago, uh, one of the narcissist's favorite defense mechanism is blame shifting. They'll try to make you feel like it, but you need to pull back and ask, have I been the one that tries to uh, initiate uh, rotten feelings in other individuals and try to shame them and make them feel like they're awful individuals? More often than not, the narcissist is going to do that to you. Now, you may sometimes get uh, sucked into the point counterpoint, and you'll need to come to terms with that and 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 adjust on that. But um, don't don't hold on to guilt that doesn't belong to you. Uh, now, you may feel grief. All right, that's a very strong emotion that comes when you break away. Uh, you may have some anxiety or fear regarding the future because much can be unknown, and it's it's normal. And to be expected if you have that kind of emotions, but, but don't take uh, blameworthiness and take that on yourself. Uh, that's, that's the guilt that does not belong to you and then see it uh, for where it goes. And that is, it goes straight onto the back of that uh, narcissist who's initiating it in the first place. And, and uh, the fact that this person is struggling so much emotionally tells me one really large thing about that person. And that is relationships matter. And you know what my reaction is? Good for you. I, I'm glad that you do have that, uh, that desire to say, I really want to be a party to healthy relationship connections. That's what you desire. That's why it hurts so much. But unfortunately, we know that many people cannot and will not reciprocate with you. And so even though it hurts greatly, it's kind of like going through surgery. You know, you're going to go under the knife and it's going to be uh, painful and you can't say to the doctor, okay, let's do the surgery, but can you just do it where it doesn't hurt uh, when we're on the other side? Well, it does. Uh, but just like when you have a, a physical operation, when you have a psychological surgery or operation, uh, it, you can heal and you can move on. You may still have a limp as you move on, but you can and so I just know that the guilt is not yours to carry. Okay. Now this next one, um, this, this kind of gets to the, uh, uh, to the issue of, uh, you know, why are we doing this when we break away from narcissists? Um, this person asked, I haven't found the answer to one question. Considering that narcissism is a condition or a disease, should we really punish the people suffering from it by leaving them and going no contact? Should all narcissists be left? I'm struggling to accept this because I don't find it fair to leave someone due to a condition they have. Now, there you are. You're a, a soft and a tender soul. And um, I, I strongly suspect this individual is an empath. And they're thinking, well, if I go no contact, you know, what's going to happen to them? And I respect that. Now, there are times, though, when the, uh, the narcissist is so egregious and so relentless and they simply cannot and will not uh, change their way. There's a hardness that they have, uh, have taken upon themselves. You have to ask, is it punishment? When you leave someone and say, I can't do this anymore, is that what we're doing? Uh, and the answer is, no, this is not you punishing them. Uh, as an example, let's suppose that you have somebody that has a heart condition. And uh, and then over time, that person uh, says, well, I'm, I'm, I refuse to take the medicine. I refuse to uh, do anything that's going to be helpful. I'm not going to change my diet. 
and then they uh, they bring all sorts of strain and difficulty. Uh, is it wrong for you to say, I can't be a party to this then if you refuse to help yourself? And, and sometimes uh, it's that's the case. Narcissists, it's like, uh, first of all, they don't acknowledge like a heart patient might that they even have a problem uh, that's called narcissism. Uh, but uh, you're not punishing someone who's directly inflicting uh, their uh, difficulties onto you. At least the heart uh, patient is they're doing it to themselves. The narcissist is doing it to you. Uh, there's a huge difference between uh, 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 punishing someone by moving away uh, in, in a punishing way versus moving away in self-preservation. Uh, and there are times when you have to preserve yourself and you have to, to take care of who you are. And so that's not the same thing as punishment. Uh, another way to put it is uh, there's a form of ma uh, managing your anger that we refer to as assertiveness. Uh, which is not the same as aggressiveness. Uh, aggressive anger means that you're standing for your in your in preservation of your worth and your needs and your convictions at the other person's expense. Assertive anger means that you're standing in preservation of your worth and your needs and your convictions in a clean kind of way with uh, good motives. Uh, the the, uh, the the intent of assertiveness is to try to bring healthiness. And if somebody is, is being rude and mean and harsh and uncooperative for you to say, all right, I guess I'll just go along with that. That's not healthy. But for you to say, I'm going to remove myself from this. If you wish, wish to change and adjust, then we can reconsider. But if you don't, I'm not helping you, nor am I helping myself and other people attached to it by saying, I'll just stick around and just let you keep kicking me in the shins. No. And so uh, you, you, you need to learn uh, uh, to, to acknowledge the difference between proper guilt or in this case, punishment and, uh, and, and call it by the name that it is. Uh, when you go no contact, often uh, it's not punishment. It's just necessary uh, self-preservation. OK. Uh, OK, let's shift gears a little bit here. This person asked the question. Could you address what could be considered to be an obsession with, with wealth and fame in our society? And specifically, how do we ignore it? Um, now, there, there is a form of narcissism that we refer to as vanity narcissism, you know, covert narcissism, malignant narcissism, et cetera. But the vanity narcissist is the one that says, well, if I can get enough bling, if I can get enough evidences, physical evidences uh, of uh, success, that means that I've really uh, 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 risen above other individuals. That means I am now a somebody. And so uh, many narcissists like having the, uh, the physical show, whether it's how they look or what they drive and uh, the houses they live in. And, and they, they can sometimes um, spend money like there's no tomorrow and get themselves in debt, but they sure look good doing it. Uh, by, by the way, there's actually been a study that shows that people who buy exotic cars, you know, the Maseratis and, and, um, you know, the, the really big expensive showy uh, kind of Corvettes and all like that, uh, have a, uh, there's a higher propensity of people who buy those cars than who might buy, you know, let's say a, a regular routine kind of car. Uh, it, it's interesting how that works. Uh, and can you address how we have an obsession with that? It, it comes down to defining the word success. Narcissists think success means they're better than you, that they have more than you. They win. It's a competition. I hope that your and my definition of success is much more internal. My definition of success is you know how to love that person that's right there in front of you. That's a successful person. Or my definition of success means that you treat people well with dignity and civility, DR, DRC, dignity, respect, and civility. Or success means that uh, you have a reliability factor. Your word is your bond. You're trustworthy. In other words, those are all internal agreements or uh, ingredients. Whereas the narcissist like, eh, forget that internal stuff. Keeping in mind, they're still in their pre-adolescent thinking. I just want to be the king of the hill, the queen of the hill. I want to be the one that looks the best. And so uh, until um, people can learn to go into that interior, they're going to be drawn towards 
these uh, fool's gold or false uh, elements of, uh, of success. And um, I hope that you and I can see it for what it is. And when you say, how do you, uh, how do you ignore it? Well, sometimes it's right there in front of you, but what I'm not going to do is just go into it and think, Oh, I got to have me some of that. No, you don't. You're, you're going to be just fine without it. All right. Uh, another question. Can an entire family be narcissistic? And the answer is, yeah, they can. Uh, I've known some families where uh, there are multiple sons and daughters and mom and dad, and they all have been trained to think of themselves as being several notches above everybody else. Very commonly, whenever there's a family narcissism like that, and there's kind of like, well, there's all the rest of the slobs out there, and then there's us. Even inside of those, uh, uh, there tends to be a primary narcissist who drives it. You know, the matriarch of the patriarch, who, uh, who who's the uh, the one that says, you know, I'm going to set the pace. And we're all going to be on the same team here. Often, there tends to be a scapegoat who's inside that. Now, if if you don't go along with that, uh, with their system, then they uh, uh, they're they're just going to put all of their hate and anger onto you. It's so interesting how uh, you can have systems, we call it uh, collective narcissism or communal narcissism, uh, where we think of ourselves as better than. So yes, it's it's something that can be there. And then uh, there's all sorts of um, diversity, if, we, if you can say that, inside those groups. Sometimes it's all of them. Sometimes it's part of them. Sometimes uh, you, know, you have one that's the primary one. You have the flying monkeys that make apologies for the big kahuna narcissist. Sometimes you have the scapegoat. It's it, it's uh it's fascinating to get into that. We don't have time to get into all of that, but uh, but yes, uh, it, it certainly is possible. Uh, now this next one, and this kind of goes along with the theme of you being the kind of person that's really trying hard to think rationally and and then make some good sense of it. Um, and and I hope this is one that all of us can ponder. This person asked, Doctor C, do you find it difficult when you see fewer people? who are thinking in a healthy way, but you want to live in a healthy way and be on team healthy because really it came many times for me where I, it, there, there came many times for me where I started doubting myself. Am I the one who's thinking wrong or is there some, something wrong with me? But every time with more patience, truth will appear clearly. And again, I'm able to trust myself. Really, it made me think how you're feeling while uh, uh, it made me think how you are feeling while you're standing for DRC in this broken world, while so many people around you are fighting in a different direction. Love and respect to you and Team Healthy. Um, let's keep in mind that uh, I have what I refer to as my 2080 breakdown of the uh, human population and 20 percent maybe. Uh, generous. I, I don't really see a large percentage of the people in our world really thinking carefully about what it means to be on Team Healthy. Um, I mean, just go to any store and just kind of look around. I'm, I'm an observer of people. And I, I, if I'm at the grocery store or uh, wherever, I, I'm, I'm kind of watching thinking, well, do these individuals, have they thought through who they are today and how they're living and uh, what drives them? And many people are just kind of going through the motions. Some folks are just trying to survive. Uh, other folks, just, it's like, why would I worry about that? What's for supper tonight? And uh, that's all they do. There are, though, some of us, and I put it at around the 20% level, who say, well, I want to have meaning in my life. And I want to have a sense of purpose. And I want to have uh, many defining ingredients that take me to a good place. And I'd love to have as many people join me there as, as possible going back to the notion of standing in love and standing in decency and kindness, uh, being a, 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 an appropriate servant. And even when you have to be assertive, knowing how to do so in such a way that allows other people to walk away with their dignity still intact. There are a lot of people out there that just don't know how to do it. And so do I find it difficult when I see that there are not nearly enough people? Yeah, I do. Uh, which is why I do the work that I do. Uh, hopefully we can whittle away at that percentage, at least a little bit in your sphere of influence and in my sphere of influence so that we can say, you know, there really is a better way. 
I'm hoping that as you survive some of the difficult circumstances in front of you, you'll be watching for other people who say, I need encouragement. And you can say, well, I'd like to be that encouragement for you. I noticed that on the uh, the side here, you give so much encouragement and words of kindness and wisdom uh, to individuals that are in our virtual community. That matters. And so it hurts. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, once you see what it means to be on Team Healthy versus the alternatives, you don't want to go back. And let's not go back, okay? Uh all right, how are we doing on time? Um, this this one, I just had to put this one in because uh, we talk about consistent inconsistency. This person um, was probably shaking her head uh, when she uh, mentioned this. Uh, said, my ex-husband wears a wedding band, but he's not married. What do you think, Dr. C? And uh, what I think is, there you go, lying again. You know, when you wear a wedding band, it's your way of saying I'm off the market. I don't want to, I don't want to be uh, pulled into any kind of wrong temptations or I don't want to give the message that says, uh, uh, yeah, I'm available because I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm happily attached to someone else and we have a, a good thing going. There's a whole lot going on there. Narcissists though, it's like, well, I'm not married. It used to be. Um, but if they think that marriage has a certain pr prestige, oh, well, I can still pull the ring out and wear it. Or if they uh, think that appearing single will give them certain advantages, they'll take the ring off. It's part of their commitment to lying. And now that is that's not subconscious. Some of the some of the stuff that they do is in fact subconscious. This that's just pure. Uh, that's just who they are. That's how they manage life. And that's just uh, that's raw lying, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so what do I think? I think that your ex husband is committed to being a liar. That's what I think. Um, okay. Uh, real quickly, I, I'm going to do this last one. And, and uh, how about if I uh, put these together because they have a similar uh, angle to it with family members. And this will be kind of uh, part of what we have during our family time during the holidays. Uh, the first person asks, I have to deal with my narcissistic mother. We're, we've been very low contact, but it's not possible to go to zero. I haven't gotten along with her for over 20 years and she well knows my feelings. She no longer even pretends to be nice to me. We don't like each other. I'm an independent adult, but she belittles me and tries to force her entitled uh, uh, attitude upon me and is very sarcastic. My question is, how do I stop myself from being rude back to her? Uh, and then there's another question. This person says, how do you deal with a dad that you love dearly, but loves to belittle you? Um, one of my favorite phrases is, I'm not going to let the narcissist set my pace. In each of these scenarios, one, you have a mother who's just uh, a long time been hateful and condescending. Uh, and then another is you have a, a dad that you love and you want to engage with, but uh, that's constantly criticizing and belittling people. In advance, you want to give yourself small bite-sized chunks of time that you're going to monitor yourself and your own emotions. Uh, for example, uh, you know the answer is, uh, if my mother is uh, critical, then I don't need to get involved in some sort of uh, you know, fruitless discussion. You know, that's the correct answer. If my dad is criticizing, I don't need to, uh, to become defensive. That's the correct answer. Let's take some, uh, some bite-sized scenarios. Uh, if you're going to be with mother on Thursday afternoon between one o'clock and four o'clock, you might begin to anticipate what am I likely to uh, to experience with mother? Or if you're going to be with dad from one o'clock to four o'clock and you know that he's going to get into all of his criticisms, uh, uh, you know, what, how, do, how do I want to conduct myself in those scenarios? <coughs> Pardon me, I get choked up thinking about it. And then you give yourself an assignment. When my mother goes critical, or if my dad belittles someone I know, uh, I might stand up and say, you know that I don't think the same. Okay, that's enough. Or uh, you're saying these things, assuming that I'm supposed to go along with you. I'm not. It's okay to say those things. Give yourself permission during that stretch of time to, uh, to offer up your distinctives and your differences. 
And, and it may be that you'll need to break it down. Uh, you may be in the middle of a very difficult time and you may think, okay, I, I don't know if I can handle myself well for three hours. In the next 30 minutes, how am I going to conduct myself knowing that that person is going to be hateful? And it may be that you'll need to give yourself a, a, a break and say, I, I'm going to uh, allow myself permission to take a 30 minute break. Or it may be that you'll decide for the next 30 uh, minutes, I, I'm just going to be patient and quiet. 31 minutes from now, I don't know what I'm going to do, but for the next 30 minutes, I know how I'm going to handle it. And try to break your days down into bite-sized chunks of time, coaching yourself up on who you define yourself as and how you want to conduct yourself. That way, that other person isn't going to be in total charge and you're not just going to go in as a raw reactor. Okay, G give that a try. Okay, well, we've got plenty of questions, I believe, a lot on the table here. Uh, I, I really hope that you have a, a happy and meaningful holiday season. I know we have people from different traditions, and I hope whatever your tradition is during this time of year, it's a good one. Uh, and, and I hope that you're able to find a sense of peace uh, during this time and uh, personal reflection. And uh, just know that uh, we're all on Team Healthy. We're uh, around the world, but we're trying to assist each other in our encouragement of one another. And I, and I hope that that's something that you take seriously. I'm glad you're on Team Healthy, and I'm glad you allow me to be on. Hey, hey by the way, um, we, we've spruced up our uh, little bookstore uh, or storefront. We have coffee mugs. We have some T-shirts and all like that. So if you're interested, uh, uh, check that out. And, uh, you know, might uh, give you a little momento on that. And, uh, and just know I will be here next Wednesday, but the Wednesday between Christmas and New Year's. And so uh, put your questions out there and I'll be picking up on them and I will see you then. I love being a part of your journey with you. And I, I'm so thrilled that you allow me to, uh, to be a part of your life and that you're a part of one another's lives here. Uh, Let's keep our efforts up and let's uh, uh, let's be uh, a, a force for peace and goodness. You want to join me on that? See you next time, folks. All right. Bye bye.